Although I worked, I worked in the shipping department packing games in 1974. Oh, so you're actually technically there before me. Yeah, but then I was gone for three, you know, three, four years. I, I worked there for like a few months, but then my art school schedule didn't allow me to really work days as much as uh, they wanted me to. So uh, that, that, that ended my uh, shipping career. <laughs> <laughs> I only worked in the shipping department during Christmas, you know, when, you know, when they were going crazy back there. Yeah. Yeah. How many units would, how many units would uh, SPI ship in a, 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 year? a year? I mean, ballpark, a million, a hundred. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait. So the magazine was, when I was, when John and I were there in 77, 78, the magazine was running around 36,000 subs. Yeah, 30,000. 36,000 times six, so do the math, right? And then I would say we used to do about 40 games a year. I remember Dunnigan usually used to use that number a lot, right? About 40 games a year got published on top of that, John. Oh, and on top of the issue games? Oh, yeah, that, sure. Yeah. Uh, well, that would be like three a month. I don't Yeah, maybe. Look, go back and look at the old issues. I think it's... I don't think that's off by, I mean, I could be high. Yeah, I guess I that, that's, that's not too far off. Yeah, <laughs> I, I remember John, Jim saying it was like he was, his, his economics were based on about 40 games a year plus the magazine. And they would uh, sell like 15, 20,000 of a, of a box game? Mm, that sounds high. Yeah. I would say more like 10, 400,000. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, it wasn't a million, but I guess it, we were selling in uh, hundreds of thousands of, you know, between the magazines and the games. I think we were in the hundreds of thousands, yeah. Yeah, it, it wasn't a sales problem that ended the, the demise. Well, it, was, it was the sales model. <laughs> well, the business model didn't support a non-direct sales model. Yeah. I was just thinking about that today, how if – if the internet was around when SBI was around, I think it would have, SBI would have flourished. Yes. Oh yeah. In fact, um, when, in the early days of GMT, Gene and I had long, long conversations about what took, took, you know, why did SPI go bust? So the, um, our printer was a company called COSI, C-O-S-I. They were over in Brooklyn. Yeah. And, and COSI, we were into COSI for some crazy numbers. Seymour, right, exactly. But he was, <laughs> but Seymour was the head of, you know, that was Kosi. I've been there. I mean, you must have been there sometime. Did you ever go there? Uh, I don't think I went there. I mean, Seymour sometimes came to the office, so I met him. Oh, yeah, yeah, we saw Seymour. But no, I, Redmond used to take me to uh, Kosi a lot. I was kind of like, I was, I, even though I was in the R&D department, he was one of the, I was one of the few, well, he liked me, and, and he used to trust me with, like, the stat machine and I used to let me do a little bit of light, you know, map work, and 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 I used to go with them sometimes. And you know, when we were going to Kosi and checking, um, you know, blue blue lines and stuff, he used to take me with them sometimes. So I've been to Kosi, you know, 30, 40 times. They had uh, three presses. Um, did they have a four color press? Uh, yeah, they got a four color press in near the end, but there was there was like two two color presses and one three color press. That's why Redmond had to do all sorts of magical things with the. Uh, with the ink to get different colors. Yeah, until like 80 or 81, we, we that's when we started doing four color stuff. Right, but I was gone, I left in, um, Yeah, I was gone by then. I well, came right, back right. in 81. Yeah, you were there and then you left and then you came back near the end. Yeah, exactly. Just in time to whisk <laughs> us to, to victory games. That was awesome. <laughs> it was. It was a, it was a, it, it was an interesting time. <laughs> it was the craziest thing you and I probably did in the bit game business, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, so, Harold, is there anything? Is there anything like you? You wanted to talk about SPI? Is there any like burning question you had in your mind you could ask John? Well, I, I have a boy. I have a million questions. Well, but if, well, so, so, so th if that was the craziest thing you guys have done in your gaming life, why, why was that crazy? Why was the Victory Games thing crazy? Well, starting a game company from scratch. I mean, literally our first right. meeting, we had we took cardboard. Remember, we were sitting on the floor, John, with cardboard yeah. under us because we didn't have any furniture. <laughs> yeah. Oh, at the office. But before that, we met a couple of times at your house. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And uh, and Carol made us tuna salad sandwiches. She's very nice that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. She's still uh, nice. She she uh, she just. I'm trying to keep my voice down. The she she's up. She went up to bed. I well, she's reading in bed or something. But I didn't want to. Uh, are you in New York now or San Diego? 
Neither. I'm in West, well, in Westchester, New York, but not New York City. I'm in Westchester. Oh, right now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm like that direction right there is the Hudson River. I can see the Hudson River from my uh, front porch. Okay. Uh, well, so. Mark, Mark, keep an eye out on the British and, and, and uh, <laughs> John, yeah, John, you're, right. John, you're apparently living in Middle Earth, is my understanding now, right? Yeah, although, uh, let me, uh, instead right now, I'm going to go back to the dawn of time. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. All right. What is that monolith all about? <laughs> so, I mean, so Victory Games, so you had to understand SPI was, the, the fall of SPI was a corporate raid by TSR. You yeah. Know? In fact, did you? I had two, I had a paycheck for two days. I was a TSR employee. Technically, did you get the same? You must have got the same thing. I, I might have. I, I, I guess my I, last I paycheck, did. My last paycheck was two paychecks. One was SPI, and it was two days of TSR. So technically, I was. And as soon as I found out I was a TSR employee, I quit <laughs> the next day. <laughs> yeah, that was that's, so. So the whole victory thing was we kind of pulled the rug out from under them. Yes, we it did. Was not expected. No, we we definitely. I had to say, well, you know, arrogance knows no. Uh, you know, they weren't thinking too hard. No, yeah, and, and I would say arrogance definitely describes the maneuvers that TSR did regarding uh, SBI. It was pure. It had nothing to do with interest in game design and interest no. in. No, it was just pure arrogance. Like we can do this, so we're going to. Oh, oh, what's that? oh, there's it. We've got some Victory Games logo showing up here on screen here. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> but uh, so what else you got, Harold? What else do you want to ask about? You had a million questions. That's only one. Oh, Mark, I actually was trying to remember with when we did that move to Victory, was yeah. there anyone we wanted to join us that didn't? No. Uh, no? We, yeah. It was, you know, the four, it was, it was Eric Lee, you, me, um, now Jerry, now Chris Klug, yeah, and yourself, of course. We were the four designers, and we had and uh, Ryer. Ryer. We had Ryer and Ted Kohler. Ted Kohler, and then, Kohler. and well, and my ex-wife. Oh yeah, Trish was like our office. Oh, and and Jerry Glickenhouse was our Jerry Glickenhouse. I know, yeah, Jerry Glickenhouse. That was our marketing guy. Yeah, and uh, and Trish, right? Yeah, right. right, right. Um, is that the our offices on? Uh, 33rd? It looks like it. Where did you get this picture? Is that SPI? Yeah, we're, we're, no, that was an SPI. Go back to it for a second. Let me see that picture of whoever did that. I'll tell you in a second. Is it the, is that the um, teacher's building or is it the, let me see. I gotta take a quick look. That is, no, that is not, you know, it's not, it's, it's not victory gains because to the left of it, to the, to that direction, to the right would be the Empire State Building, which that clearly is not. So this is, this must be, is that the uh, 43 West 33rd? Oh, that's the original uh, office that I started in and John started in. Yeah. Um, the, no, no, that's 33rd, oh, 23rd Street. Was well, 33rd, no, so, so isn't that victory? Uh, wasn't that, weren't? No, that address was 33rd? victory games, yes, but that's not victory, that's not the victory office. That's the front of Victory, 43. That's the that's the Victory office there. Yeah. And Mark, I was going to point out, you might note it, note it that it's um, it's in front of Empire Exotica. Empire <laughs> whatever, Exotica? Whatever that I, guess that's most, I don't remember that being there. We had, a, across the street was definitely that deli, because I used to get my, uh, you know, my bacon, egg, and cheese every morning there, right? There was a, that, there was like that, you know, b bodego deli place that was right across the street. And it was a pizza place. Well, I remember, Mark, you having to deal with the Mafia about, about our trial. Oh, yeah, the Mafia. That was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, um, we, we used to pay, you know, every, it's garbage collection in uh, New York, right, uh, Harold? Yes. And um, we were paying um, approximately $35 or $45 a month for garbage collection. And then I get this bill that are, it's being raised to $150. And... You know, I called Steve Skelly. I said, what do I do? And so we got, um, so I called up the garbage company and I realized I was talking to the mafia. I think I used the word respect about a thousand times in the first sentence. <laughs> and I more or less said, look, I mean, of course we'll pay if we have to, but we have no money and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So he only, so I think it went from 35 to 45 instead of 35 to 150. 
<laughs> so I groveled uh, very, very appropriately on the phone to the mafia, and they didn't raise our garbage collection too much. But did you owe them a favor at some point in the future? And they were. I, I don't. I don't recall offering or having to give a favor, and it's been a long time. So I think we're good. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <sighs> oh yeah. Oh, the Victory Catalog. Look at these great old pictures. 1987. That's pretty late. Yeah. This is a. Uh, in fact, this would be the last catalog. I left Victory in. Uh, November of 87. Okay. So what was the what was the hottest selling game at uh, Victory Games? Dr. Ruth's Game of Good Sex. It wasn't anything close. Yeah, well, that aside, what's second? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so if you get away from, you know, Dr. Ruth, um, the, the, biggest, the, the biggest seller of actually of all time because it went through because of the Gulf War, was actually Gulf Strike did a little over 40,000 units. Um, Hell's Highway. What about Ambush and all of Yeah, Ambush things? was definitely in the um, low 30s. Yeah. Not all the modules, though, but the original Ambush did like over 30. Pacific War was like 36,000. Hell's Here's Highway the, uh, was like 28,000. Uh, Civil War was like 31,000, 32,000. This is the uh, Ambush map, I think. <laughs> no, I think that looks like Dr. Ruth. Yeah, it's an ambusher, right? But it's not that one. Wow. I don't think I've ever seen the map for that game. <laughs> we actually sold uh, over 400,000 copies of that. That is, that's a shame. I mean, I, I mean, it's good for the company, but. Well, you, you, your, your raises those years came from that game. Well, I was gone by then. Uh, doctor, you were gone by Dr. Ruth already? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember. Uh, you went yeah. to work for that, like, um. Like the Kennedy guy, right? One of the... No, like... first I went to Coleco. Oh, Coleco, right. I right, went to right. Coleco to work on ColecoVision, which was like, you know, a competitor of Intellivision and, and, and Atari and all that. Yeah, and there were several game designers there. Uh, there was uh, uh, Paul Jacques was there and Dennis Astaire and Joe Angelillo and David James Ritchie went to work there. Uh, a lot of game designers at Coleco. I had a funny, I had a funny relationship with David, but I thought we, we had like a respectful relationship. But he was a really good designer. I, I David really James him. Ritchie, excellent designer. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, I still pull out. Um, he did a game on like France, nineteen forty. I forget the title of it, didn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah, I forget the name of it. It's but he did a, it was a France, nineteen forty game. I really liked that one. It's one of the better ones out there. Yeah, I was just playing his his game Lost Victory that he did for GMT on on Kharkov. Uh, that was that was a very good game. Yeah, yeah, he was a good designer. He passed away a long time ago, though, didn't he? Yeah, he it was like two thousand three, two thousand four that he passed away. So it's been yeah. a while. Yeah, we lost uh, Ed Curran. Um, not Ed Curran. Um, who was the guy we hired in the art department who used to work for the New Jersey newspapers? He was he worked with Glickenhaus and that Glickenhaus uh, clue on the James Bond project. Oh, Kern, Bob Kern. Bob Kern, yeah, you know he passed away. Yes, yes, I, I saw that on Facebook. We're gonna start. We're all two old guys, you know. John and I. I'm gonna be 66 in a few days. I think John's a little bit younger than I am. I'll and, be 66 uh, in, in uh, December. Okay, so you're. Oh, that's right. We're the same age. So my birthday's the 18th and yours is in December. So you're, we're, we're like a less than a month apart probably. Or yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So uh, if I go back to SPI, like I, I remember like um, Redmond, of course, we all knew Redmond and um, Richard Berg, of course, has passed away. And yeah. um, uh, you know, um, Terry died, of course, also. Uh, Terry. You know. Um, oh, Hardy? Hardy, yeah. Yeah, Terry Hardy, right. Yeah, yeah. I, right. I blanked out on his last name for a second. Um, yeah, so we've lost a bunch of, from that crowd. And I think the only one who's died from victory was Ed. Was uh, was Bob Kern. Bob Kern. Bob Kern. I keep wanting to say Ed Kern. Oh, there we go. That's, oh, that's yeah, the there's the David Ritchie game. I knew it was yeah. Victory in the West. I knew it was a, a friend. Yeah, it's a really good game, by the way. It's one of the better ones out there, I think, on that topic. You got a whole bunch of, oh, yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, that counter design looks the same as the ones also he did for that uh, Kharkov game he did. Yeah, I think it was. Maybe it's a similar system. It is, I think I think it is the same. And he also did something on, isn't there a Norway version of something like that also? Or was it a Winter War? He did something up in the north there. He did well, do something with Finland. Finland was the Finnish one. That's also very good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, for a while, David uh, was the head of R and D at SBI. Uh, right, he was he was the head of R and D when I got there from uh, the Defense Department. Yeah, was doing. he was the head of R and D then. Yeah, it had been Brad Hessel, but Brad went more into kind of overall operations of the company. So uh, we brought in David, we saw how well the head of R and D. We saw how well that went. Yeah, well, uh, and and we we brought in David, but uh, yeah, oh. great designer. Uh, He's credited with Cobra. He's one of the two. He did it. That's well, that's, he, did, yeah. he had nothing to do with the original Cobra. No, no. He, that was, I thought he did. Didn't he do the magazine version also? No, no. You mean the SBI Cobra? Yes. No, he wasn't working at SBI yet. Cobra was by um, Brad and uh, David Wearden. Oh, no, no, we're agreeing. I thought Brad Hessel did it. That's why. Oh, thought. Brad, yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we I thought you were you. talking about David Ritchie. No, no, David Ritchie didn't do that game. No, no, I, I, yeah. was, with, I was there when Brad started, when Brad was working on it. Um, it was a Guderian. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Although Guderian it evolved Guderian. a lot during the design. He did a good job with that. That was one of the, the first games I play tested. When I started coming to SBI to play test, I, I play tested on Cobra and, and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that experience. Yeah, I think there, there was some problem with it. When it came out, I think it had something. Arena of Death. Oh God! Actually, you know the best one of the areas. My two favorite areas games. The one I liked is the one that um, Star Trader was it called? Oh, Nick Carp designed Nick, that. Yeah, it was a great game. He was yeah, a really good player. economic game. Yeah, he was in high school when he did that. Yeah, Nick Carp was definitely a wonderkind. Isn't that the one we got the famous science fiction writer to write the, the story in Ares? Yeah, uh, well, that was, no, that was Harry Harrison for the Stainless Steel Rat. Stainless Steel Rat, right. Yeah, yeah. and Greg Kostikian did a game on that that was also very good. But the story was quite good. I remember the story. It was great. Mm -hmm. Great story. Well, you get a real science fiction writer to write a story. You get a good story. <laughs> yeah. I remember the, we the also had a really story, good comic book illustrator. Key, the key of the story was... He kept this guy who he was trading with would always give him a gun and to see if he would shoot him. And in this one scene in the story, he he sh he, he goes, Oh, it's it's got bullets this time because it's this much heavier. And he shot him. <laughs> he killed the guy, he took all the money. I thought that was a great thing. Because <laughs> the gun was always unloaded before that, but this time he loaded the gun. There, Star Trader. Great game, yeah. by the way. Great, great game. Yeah. Now that cover was done by a guy named Tim Truman, who did a lot of artwork oh, yeah. for, for Redmond and went on to become a very respected comic book artist. Uh, no, it's, it's one of the better covers. Well, you know, yeah. that, I gotta tell you, Aries was just, I thought Aries was going somewhere and then of yeah. course, the company folded. But Aries was going somewhere. Really good game. I always had fun with that game. Of course, the problem with the SPI stuff is the component, you know, we had, we were stuck with a certain kind of component. You know, you can't do the stuff like you do with GMT. You get some wood and, you know, you get have nice, nice cards and you know, just can't do, couldn't do that in those days. So the right. games were, the quality of the games is much better than the quality of the components. So they, they haven't aged well from a visual point of view, but they're still quite good games. Well, they're, yeah, they're exceptional. What, so who was the first to use wood? Is it you or Volco? Um, I am definitely not. The, the, I think that was a Euro thing that, that was taken by, by oh, somebody. Yeah. It wasn't me. No, it was, it to, wasn't me. Yeah, no, we copied. I think Volco. My big thing was I used cards before, you know, I was a big, I was one of the first ones to use, you know, the card driven thing. I, I, I got into the cards because I was into a Magic the Gather. I said, I got to do more with these cards are great. You know, I, I like, it was like the hand of cards, you know, I just, yeah. and we actually had a game, a game that is very high, highly, highly underrated that was done by John Prados, but then fixed by Bob Royer, which was called the Cold War. And it really, it predates, um, Twilight Struggle, but it does all the same things. It has a headline phase and everything. Remember that, John? Yeah, I, I never, never played it, but I remember looking at it. Oh, I played it a lot of times. I, I would still play it today. I It's an exceptionally good game, but it's got all the things with influence, and, you know, it, it's got that basic, you know, I, I'm, I'm not even sure that Ananda and those guys even know that game, but uh, it was it was a predecessor to um, Twilight Struggle. Yeah, there it is. It had a crappy cover, had crappy components, crappy cards, but it's a really, really, really good game. <laughs> look at These that. guys playing it, that's trouble. Yeah, they look pretty stoked, don't they? Ooh. Is that a Jim Talbot cover there? I have to believe it is. Yes, it is. In fact, if you look carefully, I can't see if the picture, somewhere in the lower lower left or lower right is going to be that, you know, 
You know what I have, by the way? I, I just look, I mean, I see him all the time. Um, we were going to do this um, Stephen King game, and uh, we had this great artist named Jim Talbot at Victory. And yeah, he, he did a bunch of test shots, you know, like test paintings for like the horror game. And there were three of them. And I would have I would have brought them up here and showed you, but I have them. I framed them. I, I they we were they were going to throw them out. I took them and I framed them a million years ago. They're hanging in my bathroom downstairs. <laughs> what <laughs> happened to the game? The game ended up becoming the well. First of all, I spoke to actually I actually spoke to Stephen King on the phone once because of nice. that. Nice. Yeah, I got a hold of him. I wanted to do his game, and he just said that he wasn't he didn't want his work to be turned into a game. Although he eventually did it later on, but uh, he didn't want his stuff into a game. He said. So I said I pre, you know, I, I respected that, but he was a very nice conversation. He's a very nice man, and I got a hold of him through his uh, publisher, and uh, offered him, you know, we we do a license game on, uh, you know, his stuff. It was going to be kind of a macabre kind of game, and but eventually became uh, the Elm Street game was what it kind of morphed into. Oh, okay, okay. We, were, we wanted, you know, Briar really, Briar really wanted to do a horror game. Uh, the game, unfortunately, not that good, but. It was a good idea. <laughs> well, when I was at SBI, I, I had a brush with horror greatness because I, I designed uh, Dawn of the Dead. So I met George Romero. Oh, that's kind of cool. George Romero. Yeah, because the they showed me the movie before it came out. It was on this brand new technology called videotape. <laughs> <laughs> so I went up to some office with Brad and we watched, we watched Dawn of the Dead before it came out. Oh, that's cool. And, and then I did the game design based on that. But uh yeah, I got, got to meet him, and he, he explained the premise of the movie to me. It was like, if I realized historically what that was, I would have, you know, been more respectful in the meeting, I think. <laughs> well, you know, well, you remember the movie, um, it was a, a Kirk Douglas movie called Final Countdown? Yeah, uh, Final Countdown. Is that Kirk Douglas? Okay. Yeah, that's where the aircraft carrier goes back to Pearl Harbor. Oh, right. Okay, so that, that, so that movie, uh, David... Douglas. So David Douglas is one of the Douglas brothers. That's not a movie actor. You know, it's not Michael Douglas or the other, you know, Kirk. So David Douglas came to SPI and they had sent us the script and Dunnigan gives it to me and says, tell me what you think. I th and, but of course, Dunnigan goes, take a look at the script. I think it's really stupid. Is how he, you know, Jim and, and I read the script and of course they wanted us to do a license game on the final countdown. You know, so I sat in a meeting with and I was just really sitting there. Dunnigan was really running the meeting with David Douglas. He looks just like uh, Michael Douglas, only he was thinner, taller, and blonder. But, you know, but it was, it was like a Michael Douglas, Kirk Douglas looking kind of guy. Very nice. And, you know, Dunnigan mostly told him it was the stupidest idea he ever said. So Jim, Jim was not one to be delicate or PC with anybody ever. No, so. he was not. Yeah, there's the movie. And, uh, oh, Martin Sheen. That's right. Martin Sheen was the uh, consultant that, like, that goes into forward in time. The, the woman was, um, what's her name? She's not in the, um, she's not showing up in those big credits, but there was a woman who's a well-known actress from that period who was like the, the girl who believes Martin Sheen. Uh, anyway, the, um, but if you ever played um, Fires of Midway, you ever played that game, uh, Harold, Fires of Midway? I have not. Oh, it's a great game. Well, I played the, one of the best carrier games, very abstract, but it's one of the best carrier games out there. They put the final countdown show uh, scenario in there without paying any money for it. Uh, you know, F-14s versus Japanese zeros. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting, you know. But, uh, yeah, I remember that. You know, and, of course, there was the um, Bashi. Did you ever meet Ralph Bashi? Bashi. Bashi, yeah, that's his name. Yeah. Yeah, he was there when we did the, the Lord of the Rings game. And that was when I learned a lot about Hollywood. So... Howie Barish and Richard Berg somehow concocted this deal where we got to do the what was it called the War of the War, the of the War Ring? we called it the War of the Ring yeah, yeah. and Berg Berg did the design with Harry Barish but it was really Berg and the, I guess what happened was we got the contract and then those guys went and um, they must have talked to another game company and they came back to us they wanted to renegotiate the contract and you know Howie uh, said you know, no way, we're not going to give you more money for something we've already got on the contract. So that guy said, you know, they did all this threatening, you'll never work for us again. And of course, then the Bakshi movie comes out. It was like part one, and it was a flop. And so we never heard from them again. But that was a kind of a cool uh, <laughs> game, by the way. It's, it just got lousy components again. You know, it's cheap cardboard counters, the, the you know, the 
cards are, you know, punch out cards and all that stuff, you know, it's just, and, um, and of course we did the uh, Conan the Barbarian game. Well, there you go. Somebody's got Yeah, you designed that one, didn't you, Mark? I did. I did design it. I actually have, in fact, you did, everybody in the art department, remember, everybody had to read stories and give me the summaries. You, remember, you must have read a, I think yeah. you <laughs> I have your notes still somewhere. Tower of the Elephant. Yeah, yeah. Tower of the Elephant. That's a good one. I yeah. like that. That's a good story. Yeah, it is. So I, did a, I did a Conan game. And then what happened was, you know, that was when right when the SPI folded up and TSR got it. And they didn't want me to get any royalties. So they redesigned the game. I don't think it went anywhere. But I still have the one cover that Redmond did of, based on the movie cover, with my name on the cover, me and, me and Arnold. So the version that came out was released by TSR? I think they did come out with a Conan game or they had the contract, whether they lost it or not. But they didn't. The design that I did, they had all the stuff for it, but they never published it. You know. They oh, okay. You know, you know sometimes I, a, I get that confused because you also did a John Carter game. That one was published. I had that. Yeah. That was yeah. done. That was when I was younger, though. That was when I was still working at SPI. Actually, right. it was right when I left SPI the first time because I think Eric Goldberg finished it because I was I was done with it. That oh, that is, was in your first tenure. Yeah, that was in my first tenure. Right, when, right okay. when I was leaving. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I had the, the one out. copy of the cover we were going to do for the game back in my house in New York City, and I had the galleys of all of the adventure stories and stuff. All the what? You know, so remember when you read the Tower of the Elephant, you had to give me a summary, right? Yeah. So the game, the way the game worked was, you were one of the four factions, and you would use either um, a warrior friend or a wizard or a courtesan to get Conan under your control. Oh, yeah. You, Conan, you, you weren't to, Conan. You, you were Conan. like someone who wanted to have Conan on your side. Right. And then when you got Conan, you could go on a Conan adventure. Yeah. Which was those decision trees that you and everybody, we all read the stories and I put them into like, you know, roll the die. You run into a big monster, roll the dice. If you succeed, go to the next phase of the story. But you got to read, the, you got a summary of all the stories of Conan. And you got to use Conan, you got extra points if you succeeded in your uh, quest. That's pretty right. cool. So no one ever played Conan. Did... Well, we played it in playtesting. I really remember fun. now playtesting that game. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, I, 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 I did that game in one night. You know, Brad said they had a Conan game. It sucked. I said, well, I can help. And I went home and I designed it in one night. And then, of course, development is a lot longer. But I did the whole game in one night. I really liked Conan. I mean, I always loved that, that particular uh, you know, uh, genre and artist. And I, yeah. I should probably, well, again, you can't do a game on Conan without, you know, it's, it's all copyrighted stuff will get arrested. So, or sued. So, yeah. But I, I got to tell you, the guys in Italy who did that War of the Ring game, they did a fabulous job with it. So it, that's, that's good enough. <laughs> oh, you mean the, the later War of the Ring? Yeah, but there was a, they also did a Conan game, which uses the same basic idea that Conan doesn't belong to anybody. Oh, I mean, okay. It, it was an Italian company. It may not have been an Aries. It might have been somebody else. But somebody, I have a Conan game that plays like the one I designed. I mean, conceptually, not, it's not, they didn't see my game and all that. But I'm just saying the idea that Conan doesn't belong to anybody seemed to be a theme that everybody figured out anytime you're trying to design a game on it. I think there was a Conan tactical game of some kind. But again, you know, like in John Carter, you want to be John Carter. You don't want to be one of the bozos. You know, you want to be John Carter. Sometimes, you know, that's a little bit hard. Yeah. John Carter, of course, is based on the Battle of Germany, Jim's uh, Battle of Germany design. With the two sides? Facing you know, the fact that you play the, you're a good guy, but you play the bad guy against the other good guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great little game battle for Germany. It is a great game. It really yeah. is a good game. Yeah. In fact, that there's the company did the company did a game called Race for Berlin. I think it's called. It was based. It was a sequel to the one they did on the Breakout of Normandy. I can't remember the title. I think it's called Race for Berlin. It uses the same concept. Mm -hmm. So, Harold, what's your next question about SPI? We we we're just yeah. Zooming along here. Oh, you man, you guys are rolling. I hate to even get in your way. No, no problem. What do you got? What's um. So what games left a mark on you? Not the ones that you designed, but from that SPI uh, Victory Games era, what, what were the most important games to the hobby? What do you think, John? What, do you, what, what was your, like, big one? As a hobby? Um, or, or to you, I mean, I don't mean to make it sound so weighty and stuffy, but what, what, was, what, what do you think was the great stuff that came out of SPI? Well, 
you know, if you were, when I think of the games that I still play, let me start that. I mean, the games of the SPR that I still play, um, I like Solomon's campaign a lot. Uh, I like um, Battle for Germany. I haven't played it in a long time, but I, I still have very fond memories of that game. What about you, John? Uh, I just played Panzerup Guderian again uh, oh, yeah. last time I was at WBC. So I guess now that's like a year and a half ago. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that game begat a lot of other games. Yep. yep. Um, that hidden, uh, that, you know, I, I look at games that were done at SPI, like what mechanic did they bring into, the, like, Panzerup Guderian is a good example. That was the untried unit thing that was very effective. Yeah. Where the Russian infantry units and armor units were not known, like were they a shitty one or a good one, was a lot of, um, and also it enhanced by accident, uh, it enhanced the solitaire playability of the game. Was that also the first game to use steps where you could flip a unit to a weaker side? Before that, the backs of units were always blank and they were eliminated on one hit. You know, that's a good question. Um, the, the problem was not in the, um, the reason we didn't do the backs was the cost and the die cutting had to get better. That was right. Uh, right. You had to do more alignment. Yeah. The alignment had to be right. So we used to have, if you look at the old SPI games, there's just the paper, you know, the color of the paper is the back of the counter mm -hmm. um, or the cardboard or whatever the hell it is. And then they, then they started putting um, just colored paper on the back. Like, you know, so the German units that were gray on the back and green for the U S or whatever. And then, you might, you know, I have to, I'd have to go look, but you might be right. Guderian is certainly one of the first games that had back printed counters because of the untried units thing. But I somehow feel that there must have been other games that had back printed counters before that. I just, well, not just the idea of the back printing, but the idea that you could flip a unit to its weaker side. Yeah. Instead yeah, of eliminating it. You could be right. I, I'm not going to disagree. I have to think about it, but that's certainly, that's an innovation in the gaming thing. Mm -hmm. um, certainly. Um, uh, I mean, there are certain systems that have stood the test of time. Um, the game Operation Typhoon that Joe Balkowski did. Oh, yeah, the ABCD the, thing, right. That started this whole kind of uh, system that became the Victory in the West system. And, and that, that game was invented kind of out of desperation because the history of that was that Bach am Rhein was a big success. So someone did a feedback proposal for a game using the Wacht am Rhein system on the invasion, you know, on, on the offensive on Moscow. So Joe Angelillo did a battalion level design for the, for the campaign on Moscow, which was thousands of units, 10, 20 units deep, right? Because it's battalion level. And, and he just said, well, they told me to do that. So Joe Balkowski was given the job of developing that. So he basically said, I got to just throw this out and, and, and go up a level. So he went up to a regimental level and invented this, this kind of system of unit class and chips for strength underneath them and did that whole thing for uh, Operation I Typhoon. I and that. Then, I that, then he extended that system to the Western Front with his games like uh, Grenade and Patton's Third Army and, yep, and yep. all those. And it's still being used to this day, the company uh, New England Simulations. Does some has done some great games using that system. Yep. Yeah. Um, yes, I got over here from the old SPI days. Um, yeah, you oh, know, one of my favorites also is um, well, so Dunnigan was um, obviously a big Battle of the Bulge guy because he did a conf article on it. He did at least three games on the Bulge. But yeah, he liked our Den's offensive was always my favorite. That was the one of the earlier ones, right? <clears throat> Yep. That was before yeah. Locked on Ryan. Yeah. Yeah, it was it, it came after his Bastogne game, which is similar to uh -huh. it, the same. Mm -hmm. I was also a very big fan of um, the old uh, SPI ACW game that he did with uh, John did with Nofi. I always liked that game. And in fact, most Civil War games copy it in some way. Even Eric the strategic Lee's game guy. on the American Civil War? Yeah, SPI so got, game. Yeah, Eric Lee's game has the same map, basically. Right. Right, and that was an issue game, I think, wasn't it? It was, number yeah. 16. Uh, no, not 16, it was a bigger number, but I had a six at the end of it. But I, ha I played that game for years, I love that. I've actually got my own modified version of it, but uh, love that game. So, Harold, what's your next question? 
Uh, well, first, let me tell the crew if they want to ask a question, if you'll either raise your hand in the participants list or uh, give me a nod that you have a question. Uh, I would take any questions that you might have. But um, I could change the background again. Thank you. Thank you. Go with Julie Andrews. <laughs> Although, John, I have to tell you, you had much more credibility in front of the monolith than you do in front of Julie. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I don't want to lose you. The sound of music or something? What is that back there? Yeah, that's there's Julie <laughs> Andrews. You know, it's the mountains. It, it's, it's neutral Switzerland. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that's funny. You're killing me. I'm afraid of touching because I figure I'll hang up, so I don't want to touch the computer. All right, I'll, I'll just go with this benign space back. Oh, I've been using that one. I like the space one. I, I, yeah. yeah. So what about um, what about people, right? I mean, were there, were there designers that you just expected to blow you away with the next? Was, was it Balkowski or Berg that you just expected would blow you away with their next idea? You well, know, for me, the best staff designer... Uh, who was there the whole, pretty much the whole time I was, was probably Joe Belkowski. Uh, uh, Cause Mark, you weren't there for a lar large, lar uh, you know, large part of the time I was there. I was there for, yeah, I was there from 76 to um, 78, 78. And then I left and I came back in 81. Yeah. I got married, I got married in between to Carol and uh, you know, I was working in defense. You know, like for says, like the most significant game for me in my lifetime, you know, forget about, you know, whether people like games of mine, but the next war is what gave me a career. I mean, yeah, yeah, that was war. one of the last games you did before I thought before you left. Yeah, I did because I got hired. Down, yeah. Uh, and down in Washington to be a defense consultant. And I was doing it for the and that really started my career because it got me noticed. Dunnigan had this friend, a guy named Phil Carver, and he was up there. He used to visit him and Dunnigan had. um asked me to give him a copy of Next War so we could look at it. So I, you know, making a copy of Next War, by the way, was like a three-day labor. It wasn't like, oh, go make a copy like you do today. You give him some computer graphics. It was like a three-day effort to hand make calendar. Oh, you mean prior to publication? Yep, yep, yep. Oh, oh. And, you know, we walked out of there with like a bag, you know, like this big with, you know, maps and counter sheets and all sorts of crazy stuff. And, you know, of course, the rules were, you know, off that uh, Burroughs printer. So, like, the rules were, like, this thick of a dot matrix printer. It's crazy stuff. Um, so, I went, to, when I was, when I was uh, well, I was basically gonna, getting ready to get married. And I, I needed more money. So, I went to Dunnigan. And Dunnigan was great. You know, you tell Dunnigan, look, I want to make more money. How do I do it? He said, look, let me tell you, I ain't going to pay you any more money. Not because I don't like you. Because the, and he explained the whole business model of the company. And, you know, so it was a very rich, rich way of saying no, no, no raise. So I knew this guy Carver that I had met and I called him up and said, hey, you guys need any work? And I saw something in an article that said that they were looking for people who could do stuff, you know, more like what we did at SPI. So I called him up. He said, they flew me down. I, I never knew that. Somebody flew me down for an interview to Washington and they hired me. Was this so, at Booz, Alan? Yeah. No, no, this is BDM, uh, Braddock, Dunn & McDonald. It was, a, it was the same kind of company, but it was, no, it was another company. Okay. And uh, that's where Phil worked as a vice president. They hired me and, uh, you know, the rest is history. But that's really where, you know, my life kind of took a different, just a, took a whole different yeah. direction. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. So what about, um, what about this, the, the famous survey and strategy and tactics, right? That yeah. the, the survey about, I mean, were, were, was the company as religious as it seemed about the results of that survey? Yes. Anything so make it was detriment, by the way. Did any, say, say that again? To, its, to our detriment sometimes. Yeah, I was going to ask, did, did anything ever slip through or should some stuff have slipped through that wasn't voted? Well, I mean, to our detriment, I mean, that Joe Angelillo design is an example of that. He slavishly followed what it said in the feedback proposal because it was, you know, successful. It didn't occur to him to challenge that or anything. He just, he just did it. Um, that's, yeah. that's how, remember, Revan did a, a game. There was they kept doing this. They kept feedback in this thing called War Production Module One or some crazy thing like that. And eventually, that became after the Holocaust. It was just like this massive economic model that was, you know, not. I mean, I play tested it. Revan maybe play tested, and I, you know, he had to get me drunk before I could play it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Although I did like. Um, 
I liked outreach, by the way. I may be one of the only people in the world who liked outreach. <laughs> yeah, it has a certain appeal. It's, it's mostly mathematical, but it does have an appeal. Yeah, well, it's very Redmond. It's very, like, utilitarian. You know, it's like, you know, it's got no frills, you know, going through time, the time-space continuum across the universe. <laughs> it was kind of cool. But as a staff member, the, the feedback was great because we we had to fill it with ideas. So every month we had an opportunity just to throw out the craziest ideas. We'd write them up. If they, if they, if they passed some kind of muster, they were, they were published and then voted on. That is absolutely correct. And I will tell you that you had two choices. You're either gonna work for somebody or you're gonna work, they were gonna work for you. So you're putting out the, I, I was reasonably successful at my proposals because almost all my proposals got it. Every month, some of my proposals got accepted, you know, and I did, that's where all the games I did came from. I'd rather do my own games than do somebody, you know, be a developer for somebody. Interesting. So here's a question. The, um, I, I did a game right near the end of SBI called Battle Over Britain. Yeah. And that was based on a proposal written by David Isby. And, you know, who who is an expert on on all things British and especially on, on British uh, air stuff and then after it was successful uh i was assigned to do the game because david isby wasn't on staff anymore and, and david isby came to me and said congratulations you have an impossible proposal to fulfill because <laughs> <laughs> the, the scale of the thing the whole battle but he talked about having individual dog fights doing the entire art you know the entire campaign so uh that was definitely a learning experience for me to to try to navigate that proposal. So Mark, uh, you talked about the next war propelling your career. Of course, another game that you did that was super topical was uh, Golf Strike. Yep, that, that was it, but that was done at G uh, Victory Games. Yeah. yeah. Golf Strike is actually the only game I designed that, were, that, that was a variant of a Pentagon. I, the game I designed for the Pentagon was called the Theater Analysis Module and uh, Model. Theater called TAM, Theater Analysis Model. And it worked, it, basically there was a classified version and I then created the commercial version, which became Gulf Strike from the, the Pentagon design. Mm. Now, Mark, is that related to, uh, we all went down to Washington with you to the War College and helped run that game. Is that the game you're talking about? No. No, that was something so, else? So when I came back, so I left SPI in 78 and I came back and he, Brad Hessel came down to see me in Washington. He hired me back because SPI had gotten a contract with DOD to do a World War III game, which eventually became the Strategic Analysis Simulation, SAS, which became a very well-used uh, Pentagon model for many years. And what happened was um, the original delivery of the game was successful and they liked it. And the National Defense University yeah. um, gave SPI a contract when I, I was running the, I was actually running a government division within, I was doing game design like Conan, but my real job at SPI at the end, 80, 81 to 82 was doing uh, government contracts. Cause I, I knew how to do that stuff. And that's, and that's it's fairly, you know, I had to get us audited. I mean, it's, I don't even go to all the details, but anyway, so we got this contract with the national defense university to actually run a game in their full, uh, you know, their um, graduation uh, seminar with all of their 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 uh, uh, students, which was about 450 of them, I was very cool, something in that that order of magnitude. And um, so what happened was SPI folded, and the colonel who we worked for, remember I took you guys down. To, remember we were sitting in his office, John. With you know, Eric Lee had that really heavy blue wool suit that he never owned. He was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hysterical. We were sitting in the colonel's office and I said to the colonel, I had already talked to Eric Dodd, I said, here's the deal. We have no contract and we have no responsibility to you, but we're going to fulfill the contract anyway. And he almost cried. Remember that guy? That colonel? Yeah. He yeah. almost cried when I told him that. And we had the best time, didn't we? we it was a fantastic time. <laughs> it was the best. Yeah, we stayed down in Georgetown yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and went in and helped run these uh, it was big paper simulations. Yeah, we ran 26 simultaneous World War Threes, and we get to, <laughs> I'm going to tell you a bunch of stories about this. John, will, so remember, John, we got there, and they wanted me to teach the game to the staff, and all of a sudden, remember we came to the auditorium, there was like 450 people sitting there. 
<laughs> Luckily, I don't get nervous in front of, I actually do not get any kind of, I have no stage fright whatsoever, by the way. So I, with no warning, I'm literally saying, we're going to have the students come, you'll, you'll talk to them. I had no warning. I walk into the, I walk out and there's literally 450 people sitting in an auditorium packed that I have to talk to. I have no preparation. And, and, and these guys are sitting in the front and I think Eric Lee had his camera. He kept taking pictures. They were always cracking up when he was taking pictures of me while I was doing this stupid thing. And then they said to me, how do we connect all this? I said, well, you're the army, right? Don't you guys have like field phones? So we connected the, they were field phones, wires strung all across the um, Industrial College of the Armed Forces of National Defense University. And literally I was sitting in a room and you had to like, like a World War II movie guy, who rang it and go, hello, and then push the talk. It was hysterical. Remember that? Yeah. And, and then it was all spread out. So uh, there was Eric and me and Bob Ryer and uh, I guess Jer Jerry Clue Jerry. was there too. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we were each one, you know, one of us per kind of room or per area. And, and you had like five games each. You had like five game. games each. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Uh, and I sat in the central part with the colonel. So every time, so like problems would go up. So in other words, if somebody had a problem, the teachers ran a, one game. And if the teacher had a question, they would like say they were in John's cluster. They go to John and say, the teacher would go to John, what do I do? And he'd tell him the answer. And if John didn't know the answer, he'd call me up and I'd tell yeah. him the answer. And it was kind of, it worked really well, by the way. Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, we, we fought World War III 26 times in, a, well, it was like a week, wasn't it? It was like three or four or five days. And then in the evening in our hotel room, do you remember what we were doing? Drinking. Well, that too, but we were playing Civilization. The oh, Avalon yes, that's right. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and they put it in the hotel we were in. We were we were actually, there was this curtain. Ryer and I were sharing a room, and I opened the curtain. It was just a wall. There was, we were below ground. There no there windows. Was, right. There were no windows. It was pitch black. Yeah. <laughs> and we were playing Civilization at night, right, and drinking. I remember I remember the drinking. I forgot the that game. It was fantastic. It was a good time. It was hysterical. <laughs> It was a good, you know what it was? It, we, we had a company with no games and we were all working on, I was working on Gulf Strike, John was working on Hell's Highway. Yeah. Um, Eric Lee was working on American Civil War. Um, and we started working on Ambush, but that, that yeah, was a little, we, we, little further. John, Eric Lee started Ambush. John kind of really pulled it together with Ryer. And I threw something. I mean, I was like big, mostly the checker on that. Like I didn't do anything with the design. Um, but it was kind of a, you know, it was, I, I, I think there was a lot of tense times that I can't remember now, which is good, but it was, but I remember it all fondly. That's all I remember now. Mm -hmm. it, a lot of good, like, I got to tell you, I remember um, working with you, John, at Hell's Highway when we started talking about the headquarters system. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and how the headquarters could be the, the, the center for all of these different assets. Yeah. And yeah. I, and I used that in Pacific War and I've used it, you know, many times since then. I think it's a great, um, it's a great way to get all this kind of like important, but you know, instead of having lots of pieces around, you can do a lot of stuff with the whole edge. That was a good innovation of Victory Games. And um, yeah, was, we did some really good games there. You know, like I think some of them, I, I mean, I think Hell's Highway is held up. I think Pacific War is, well, I'm reprinting. Are you, are you getting a Hell's Highway reprinted, John, somewhere? Uh, that's under discussion. Yeah, yeah. It, should, it should come out. I know Volkowski's uh, Korean War game's coming out again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sure Nick Carp eventually will do Vietnam again. Yeah, there are there are people talking to him about that as well. That's yeah, a great it, game. His Vietnam game. game. Yeah. Although, <laughs> so so Nick Carp is in Princeton at the time. You know, I've known him since, he, I know Nick since he was in high school. So Nick is in um, Princeton and he's going to do this Vietnam War game for us. So he comes into the victory offices on, I don't know, on one of his holidays or something he's in town his father his father and mother lived in manhattan and he plays this game i played this scenario with him which is like scenario one of the you know vietnam game I remember it's like it's like one of the operations attleboro or something like that and i loved it and we spent i mean literally we had you know like i don't know maybe there's 20 pieces on the board three game turns it took us like you know four hours to play it uh so i said to him how many scenarios are in the game? Was it this one in the campaign game? I said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> this game will be unplayable. So I made him give me 10 scenarios. In reality, he kind of cheated. There's 10, but they're really the campaign game. But there's about four or five good scenarios in that game. Otherwise, you got to play the campaign game, which is a lot of work. Would you say that, John? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really, you don't really play the campaign game. I mean, if you can leave it set up and you're, you know, for a year, you could do the campaign game. 
Yeah, or you have to. Actually, I think Vassal makes it possible because you can yeah, play, you could play it over time. But playing on a board, you'd be basically tying up a spot forever. But the scenarios are fantastic, uh, and that's really where the reputation of the game got made. Of course, a lot of guys like Volko Runke, you know, loves that game. But he was in high school, so when you're in high school, you could do anything, right? You, uh, <laughs> my mother used to let me use her dining room table. We used to play like all like drag knock Austin and everything, and then she would say to me and my friend Gary Gonzalez, and I would play these games for months and uh, Wellington's victory. And then my mother would say, okay, look, I'm having a dinner party one month from now. You got to be out of here in one month. Then we'd like really work hard to finish the game because <laughs> I had to get it off the table for the dinner party as if that was important. Yeah, I've had that speech. <laughs> you so Harold, oh, there's Vietnam. There you go. That's, a, that's definitely, that by the way, the, the soldier, that's what Jim Talbot looked like. That's Jim Talbot. That's true. Hello. You're oh, you're right. You yeah, never knew that. Nice cover. Yeah, but that's Jim Talbot. Uh, nobody else in there. Uh, although I was Sarge in many, many of the covers, at least from my body shape. Um, I was young then. But uh, that's uh, oh, I see what you're doing. You're going to BGG and you're pulling up the images. There, there's the map. Good map. Yeah, one of Ted Kohler's nice ones. Yeah, Ted, you know, Ted really did produce some really good stuff. New from Victory Games, Spring of 84. Holy cow. Holy cow. So what else you got for us, uh, Harold? Well, we got a few questions from the audience. I think the, sure. first is, the first is people want to know what John's drinking. John, what are you drinking? Oh, I uh, enjoy martinis, gin. Okay. Uh, this was shaken, not stirred. Thank goodness. Yeah. I'm drinking, I'm drinking straight scotch. There's, All right. There, there was there some debate go. as to whether or not that was a margarita, John. So I'm glad to hear mm, it. Uh, if I'm going out, my wife will drink margaritas, but uh, generally I prefer a martini. Going out is that is that a thing you get to do anymore? No, <laughs> no, no. It's been a while. So it's all martinis. Oh, uh, that's good. Yeah. Well, uh, so another question from the audience: favorite game from Victory Games era? Favorite game? Um, and you can't don't please don't say Doctor Ruth. No, it's definitely not favorite game Ruth. from the Victory Games era. Yes. Well, and one that's not ours. Is that what you're going to say? Oh, I, I, you know, Mark, if you want it to be yours, I would listen. I mean, John, I, I mean, I, I, well, obviously, I'm just to be, for the reality of it, I'm right in the middle of the reprint of Pacific Wars. So I'm playing Pacific Wars. So, I mean, that's, but if I, if you want to say to me, the game that I actually really liked to play, if I had the right people, was I really liked the James Bond role playing game. Hmm. It's a really good, uh, it was, yeah. Fun. I enjoyed testing that a lot. That was a lot of fun. Jerry Klug uh, designed that. Chris yeah, he goes by Chris now, but yeah, same yeah. person. Yeah. Yeah, he's a big fan, apparently, of Pericles. I didn't know. He, he wrote me a nice note the other day. We still correspond. So, uh, but I guess it, the game that uh, I think that, let me say it differently. I think they were like five or six iconic games out of Victory Games. Forgetting about, you know, I think that... Um, uh, American Civil War. No, it was just called Civil War. Civil War was yeah, the, the, the game that War. people loved. Um, Hell's Highway, um, Pacific War, Vietnam, Ambush, uh, and all its, you know, all its expansions. I think those are the games that if you, oh, and Korean War. If you think about it, those games, have, I think, have held up very, very well since they were published back in the 80s. Yeah, I mean, of the ones I was involved with, the one I hear the most about is Ambush. People say, oh, why don't you why don't you do another one of those? And I'm like, no. No. Now, why don't you do another one of those? <laughs> I hired, um, in fact, I hired uh, Joe, remember Joe Reiser? I still have yeah. a with Joe yeah, Reiser. Yeah, good guy. I brought Joe Reiser in to do the expansions because nobody would do them. Yeah. <laughs> John said, I'm never going to do one again. Eric said the same <laughs> thing. I said, well, everybody wants this stuff. We could sell them. So I got Joe Reiser in to do him, and he he was a starving composer, so he would do anything for money. Yeah, so, starving <laughs> musician. That's right. <laughs> so he, he did all the expansions after I stopped working on it after Silver Star. I did a couple of missions on Silver Star. I think was, was that the second what, one? Purple Heart. Move Purple out. Heart. What was the first Star? expansion? Purple Heart or Silver Star? I can't remember. Yeah, I, I worked on the first expansion a bunch. I started working on the second expansion. It was killing me, so I finally got somebody. Yeah. What about the uh, what about the fleet series? Oh well, you know that was a successful series for us. Um, 
that was later. That was after. That was later. And of course, the problem with the fleet series, is like the, the problem with Gulf Strike, is that the scenario eventually becomes out of date. I mean, like, oh, the world know, situation changes. That's so. what I mean. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. Next war was done in you know covered like a war in Europe in the late seventies, and everybody goes, well, what about this and what about that? Well, that stuff hadn't been invented yet or you know produced yet, so it's not in the game. And I think somebody did a next war knockoff, which is in the mid '80s. That's very been very successful. I don't remember the title of it, but uh, somebody did a next war knockoff. They did it, and the, they advanced the order of battle to the, the mid '80s. So, you know, that's the problem. So the fleet series suffers the same problem. It's like there's no Warsaw Pact NATO thing, which is like six fleet and all the scenarios. Now I think Joe's re getting hired to redo it with, I guess, Compass or somebody. So he'll. Let, you can update it, but that's the problem with all modern, you know, contemporary games. Is eventually they're no longer contemporary. Right. Right. No, overtaken by events. Right. Well, you just did a really cool game on the South China Sea, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. I need to get it printed before it's all obsolete. Right. Well, <laughs> Taiwan, <laughs> they, they go before you get it done. Yeah, I hope yeah. you do. Yeah. No. What other questions you guys got from Working the, the crowd? Well, that's you know that's it. I we, we've taken up an hour of both of your time. I appreciate it. You both are so generous in sharing uh, sharing your experience. So um, you know, thanks from the crew here at the convention. We appreciate you you both taking part and uh, and sharing your experiences. We love having you around. Love walking through your games, and hopefully uh, you'll have many more years of uh, design and and sharing. <laughs> As long as John and I stay in our houses, we'll be fine, right, John? Yeah, yeah, and and as uh, uh, I am retiring next month, so I'll be doing more game design, Mark. So, uh, yeah, we'll. I, uh, I decided I'm never retiring. I'm just I had to stop. I've been working for myself for the last uh, going on six and a half years now. And yeah, I'm having a great time. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Awesome. Uh, well, I hope we can see each other in person again before too long. Well, I, I'm hoping that you know the uh, of course. If Trump is president, New York will get no vaccines. But um, short of that, I think the Biden administration will have a different take on who gets vaccines. So eventually, you know, as old guys, we'll get our vaccines and we'll be able to start moving around again. Yeah. Good. All good news. Looking forward to that. All right, guys. Thanks so much. John, okay. take care of my friend. My pleasure, Harold.